So there we have Jacob, uh, who's going to uh, talk about the agile governance, data governance, uh, a very important topic. So thanks again, uh, Jacob, for taking the time. I know it's a bit of an emergency right now, but uh, we appreciate you uh, coming in uh, and presenting this. Uh, so if you would like to share your, uh, so I see some thumbs up. So there are real people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Jacob, if you want to uh, share your presentation, please. Sure. I'll get that started. Uh, I'm also joined here by Satyam. I don't know if he's sort of connected, uh, but, but Satyam has data engineering at Grofers. Uh, I was the CTO there. I had a product engineering. Uh, I just left in um, July. Uh, and so now I'm independently uh, coaching different organizations. Um, an unlicensed corporate psychologist, I like to call myself. Uh, so this is a talk that uh, Satyam and I did a year ago, um, and we sort of were getting ready to do in March, we're really excited about, and then all this happened, and of course, like a lot of things has gone stale, but I'm going to go back in time. So all of this is where I was and what we were doing in, in March of last year, and I, hopefully it's still interesting and relevant to all of you. So um, to get started with, uh, can I get a, up, an up or a heart or whatever, a thumbs up you guys do? If you're in a committed relationship, you're married or you, you live with somebody or you're sort of have a partner of some sort. Um, interesting thing that uh, people, sorry, let me close all that stuff too. That people like uh, when you're, when you're a married couple, you fight about a lot of things. I was also married at one point. One of the things that uh, I often find we fight about is where to get, where to get dinner, what to eat. Does anyone else have that experience of trying to decide what to eat? You can up, up thumb me uh, so we can keep this, this thing going, yeah. Um, so I look, apparently I looked this up and there's actually a cystic on it. The average American couple spends five and a half, 24 hour days a year deciding what to eat. It's kind of insane when you think about it. Um, but it's not always such a simple question and a lot of people have different preferences. Um, so if I was to effort and ask these 28 or whatever people we have in the audience right now what your favorite food was, uh, I'd probably get 28 different answers. And if I was in front of you, I would actually ask you this question. Uh, but when I try to figure out what all we should go out to dinner, if we were all going out to dinner, uh, it would be pretty difficult to answer that question. It would depend sort of who I liked the most in the audience. Um, and if you take that and you extend it even further and sort of look at, you know, what it looks like to uh, decide for an entire demographic, for an entire city, for an entire customer base, it becomes even more challenging. Um, and this sort of leads me to the central point of uh where, where organizations go to be dysfunctional, uh, which is that the more people you need to agree with, the harder it is to agree. Can we all agree on that? Yeah? Uh, so when I, when I, before I worked at Grofers, um, I used to work in B2B. So I worked at a software company uh, and we sold software. And, and that is sort of like having a dog. Um, when you have a dog, your, your customers sort of like, I don't mean my customers were dogs, or they were like dogs. But when you have a, a dog, the, the dog wants something. It's usually wants to eat, wants to go outside and poop, wants to lick itself. Uh, and whatever the dog wants, you figure it out and then you get the thing done that the dog needs. Um, B2C is a bit more like ant farming. You can't, uh, you, you can't talk to your customers. You don't really know what they want. You can change their environment and see how they behave. Um, and oftentimes the ants are maybe more like hornets uh, and your, their order is you know, two hours late and they hate your guts. Um, and you have to sort of figure out what to do. This one, for instance, was a customer of Grofers. Uh, it says, are you dumb and nuggets? I asked you for different issues and you're fucking saying ask on chats. Do you think customer? What's interesting about this customer is he's a really good customer. Um, he's a very loyal. He's a very high frequency. He's a very high margin customer. Um, and so it's not always obvious what someone is saying is not always correlated to how they behave. Um, and, and it becomes very difficult to sort of use these maxims that we use as agile coaches, like why don't you talk to more customers, do a story map, blah, 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 uh, if you don't really know who you're talking about and why, if, and what their behavior actually is. And in a scale B2B, B2B, B2C setup, uh, this becomes a big challenge. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how, how those decisions get made in a scaled B2C organization. Um, and one of the things which what makes this really important for Grofers is that Grofers serves a demographic of about 300 million uh, people in India. Uh, in, Grofers at the time was the largest uh, online supermarket in India, uh, and that's a, a giant uh, swath of people of all income levels, ethnicities, religions, uh, sort of educational backgrounds, languages. Um, and so figuring out who to build for is a big challenge. 
one of the signals that we use, um, because we can't talk to all of our customers, is NPS. I know NPS is somewhat maligned, and a lot of people think it's useless. And in cases, it is. But I do find it's a good canary in the coal mine. Uh, these are the actual NPS scores uh, for Grofers about a year and a half ago. Um, and I know these aren't like, you know, Google and Apple numbers, uh, but we deliver potato chips off the back of a motorcycle. So, you know. Uh, what's interesting, though, is also how this breaks down and how you segment it. Uh, this is the data for people who make a household income of under 50,000 rupees or $700 per month and over $700,000, $700 a month. Uh, and you can sort of see some of the spreads and I'll highlight a few. Product quality. We have a 21 versus a two. So lower income people find it 21 is their NPS score and for higher income it's a two. Customer support, six minus 17. Delivery timelines, 14 minus 15. That's a 30 point spread. That's a completely different orientation to our, our product. And I think what you can see from this is that there's basically two businesses happening here. One is going pretty well and one is a complete shit show. Uh, and that wouldn't really be a problem except for the fact that our customer base is roughly split in half. So this is the actual demographics from like from the NPS survey itself and how people identify themselves. And so it means that in an organization, whenever you do any analysis on customer behavior, on average, everything's going to average out. Uh, you, you won't be able to discover the benefit because it'll come out in the wash. Any new product feature you do for the, some people, it'll go really well. And for others, it will actually degrade the service. And so when you do your analysis, it looks like nothing changed. And that's a problem. And it's not just rich and poor. Uh, when we looked at offers and discounts, for instance, young versus old, we had a two and a 13. When you look at customer support, an angry, you know, an angry man who's frustrated on the phone is a minus seven. This is an actual customer and he's, he's actually a very sweet guy. He was, he was really, he was really nice. I hate to use this picture and talk about an angry man. Um, but if you talk about a woman who doesn't have to go out and do the shopping, as most women in India have to do, uh, it's a three. She's happy just to talk to somebody and get it done. It's not great, but it's acceptable. If we talk about delivery timelines in Mumbai, where we have, you know, Nodesh can speak to this. He spent half his life in, in traffic, probably. Uh, or we have, you know, torrential rain. We have strikes. We have two highways trying to, you know, connect an entire metropolis. It's a negative 34 for delivery timelines. In Calcutta, which is a more simple city to get around in and has fewer options, it's 25. It's a 60 point spread for the same product, basically the same demographic. Um, and what happens here is not just that you don't know what customer to build for, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, it also causes internal dysfunction. So if we talk about the teams within Grofers, everybody has a different idea of what the problem is. So it's sort of the five blind men and the elephant. Um, the people who are in the Calcutta team will say that everything is great with, with last mile. We need to create more regional products. It's a category problem. People in Mumbai will say it's all about last mile. We need to prioritize last mile. We need to build a new module for rescheduling because of rain, you know, things like that. And, uh, as a, as a tech organization who drives a lot of the improvement in the business, we were always conflicted around what we should be investing in, um, from a product standpoint. Um, and. And this becomes a big problem because we also learned the hard way as a company that you cannot serve all masters. And I'm going to show, this is a, an ad here. Um, this is Grofer's first big TV ad. And I, I hope this will play. How was your day? Don't ask. Two cotton milk juices, eggs, fat-free butter, or strawberries. Aldi would it be cleaning mop chai? Lea. Kitchen we stopped there. Or a thousand dollar chili pack. Now, who are you going to be your favorite? Lilies and chrysanthemums. Ye dekho. Shia butter wali tumari cream. And lastly, Bluetooth speakers. Just for you.
You don't always get what you want, which is why we get what you need. His daughter. Grofers. Get everything. From groceries to veggies to cosmetics to tech accessories. Delivered to your doorstep. Grofers. We get it. All right. Is that pretty good? Um, thumbs up if you like the video. Yeah. Uh, I'm just okay. asking for thumbs up. I need validation, please. Um, and so you know who else who else liked that video? Um, it was our investors. So Grofers raised about 160 million in the first nine months of its existence, um, and uh, immediately, you know, sort of was all over TV, was growing like crazy. Uh, but really, it was only a $12 million business, and it pretty much went flat revenue-wise um, and became sort of the laughing stock of the startup community. Uh, Grover's had to lay off a lot of people. Uh, they closed a whole bunch of different cities. Uh, this is just slightly before I joined. Uh, and uh, because we basically what we discovered was that there really wasn't much of a market who wanted those things that we were selling in that case. Um, and so we... And I'm going to show you sort of what happened after that. So what happened after that was we decided to pivot, uh, and there was a pivot towards a inventory-led model, where Grofers sort of ran its instead of doing hyper local and delivering from anywhere to anywhere, we ran our own warehouses. I'm sorry, this is not behaving. And so this is kind of the ad that we're running with uh, now, and how we how we sort of think about the business now. <laughs> वो 20 किलो उठाना छुपे हुए ऑफर ढूंढते ढूंढते खुदी खो जाना जी मिलाती रोशनी में आंखें खुल ग्रोफर्स पे ये सब इतने कम में आता है जी हां क्योंकि ग्रोफर्स बिना शोरूम खर्च बीच के डीलर्स हटा के राशन सीधा आपके घर लाता है ग्रोफर्स से सस्ता किसी सुपरमार्केट में ग्रोफर्स सुपर राइट एंड सो इट्स अ वेरी इट्स नॉट नॉट एज एंटरटेनिंग uh, for sure, as a message, um, but let me pull this back up. Um, but it was far more effective. Um, so we went from a demographic which looked like this to a demographic which looks more like this. Uh, we went from, you know, a lot of good ideas, the things that people liked, like fruit and veg or express service or gourmet products, uh, into a great idea, which is basically taking. Uh, away from the, the solving the convenience problem, mostly for men, uh, to solving a savings problem, mostly for women, who controlled the household budgets and tried to make sure every rupee went as far as it could. Uh, and you can see the results um, in terms of our loyal customer count, in terms of our, our revenue, in terms of our growth and our scale. Um, and to give you a sense of that scale really quickly, uh, you know, 2 million customers in a month, uh, 21 cities, it's actually quite a bit larger than this now. Uh, one of the fun metrics we came up with is, is called NIPS, so a NIPS is neither this uh, nor this, but NIPS refers to noodle inches per second. So at Grofers clocks about 1,700 NIPS, which is we sell enough instant noodles uh, in one day that if it was one noodle, it would extend uh, from Delhi to Mumbai and back. Uh, I think that's pretty fun. So uh, when you're growing this fast, everything's breaking. So how do you keep things, how do you figure out you know, what you should be building for uh, and how you should be uh, prioritizing your customers because what we don't want to do is go back to the old days of trying to serve everybody and serving nobody. Um, so we took a very hard right towards savings and we want to figure out, you know, what is the part that we should be looking at? What really works? And one of the ways we did this uh, is with uh, a framework called the Reforge framework, which I won't go into a ton of detail on, uh, but I encourage you to look it up. And essentially what it looks at is uh, what early experiences correlate to long-term retention. So if you look at a retention graph, which shows month on month how many users are left uh, using the platform, we see that it flattens out you know, somewhere over here. And this is Grofer's sort of actual retention curve. Um, most organizations have a retention curve which looks something like this. There's a huge drop at the beginning, and then it sort of peters, and then it flattens. Um, and so we, we call long-term retention around month six. The problem with looking at retention is that you never really know what causes retention until much, much, much later. And you, that's not any way to run an agile business. Uh, and so we really need to know what's going to, what are early signs of retention in the business. And without that, we can do a lot of things which pump up our revenue in the short term, but don't necessarily lead to long-term benefit. Um, and the way we do that is, uh, I'm going to just sort of, I, I'm actually looking at the wrong one here. Uh, I think we want to be looking at this one. I'm sorry, I'm not as well prepared as I should be. We um, had a bit of a family emergency 
last night and uh, things got a little delayed um, there. All right. Uh, here's the one I was looking for. Right. Okay. Um, and so we, we, we establish our two different moments. Um, and just very briefly, there's habit formation, which is the, the point at which somebody has used the service enough times that we consider that they're very highly likely to retain. And we back correlate that. So we say people who make three orders in three months have a, you know, a 0.75, whatever correlation ratio to long-term retention group. So we try to get users to three orders in three months. Um, and then we back correlate that to an aha experience, which is basically in the first order, in the first month, uh, what are some of the experiences which are highly correlated to establishing a habit? And then we focus on those and focus on the users uh, who need those experiences to occur. And that's how we sort of back calculate retention. Um, this is technical. I will, you can look at the slide, you can take a picture of it. I'm not gonna explain it in detail. Odds ratio is essentially a number which shows the strength of the signal. So how strongly correlated, for instance, is an on-time order with habit formation? If it's greater than one, it's a strong signal. If it's much greater, then it's, someone raised their hand. Is that, do they want to say something? I don't know. No, full screen the slides. Sorry, my bad. Um, yes, I will go as full screen as I can, uh, given that I also want to show the, I also want to see the chat room. And now that I can see the chat room, please, please feel free to, to do that. Let's, let's do that. Much better. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so this is our, our, our habit formation uh, sort of correlation. Um, and so when we look at that, we sort of, we looked at different first order experiences. Uh, one of the things that we often hear a lot about is that in the grocery business, you, you should sell uh, general merchandise products. You should sell, um, you know, like uh, things like, you know, uh, knives and potato peelers. You should sell potato chips. You should sell pasta sauces, packaged goods, the dish dishwashing detergent, all of these things, the high margin products, uh, staples, rice, lentils, wheat, etc. Those are very low margin, sometimes negative margin products. Um, so we have a lot of push internally that, hey, we should, we, should love, we should always be trying to upsell our customers into buying these more expensive things, higher margin things. Um, but the fact is that customers who don't buy any staples on their first order have a 0.5 to odds ratio. So they are negatively correlated with our retention group. Customers who buy staples, much higher, cor much higher correlation. Um, so it's actually interesting to us that in our first order, we want to make sure someone buys staples. If they only buy general merchandise, their odds of retaining with us are very low. Um, it's a bit counterintuitive. Another one that happens all the time is... Uh, like Grofer sells a lot of its own brands, uh, our own brands that, that we own, you know, sort of like a Aldi's or a Trader Joe's in the U.S. Um, and one of the things which is often in conflict is the marketing team wants to push national brands. No one wants to run a big campaign on Grofer's ketchup. But on Kassan ketchup, we say Kassan ketchup two for one. You run a big campaign. You get a lot of people coming in. You'll get more sales that way. And so there's always this debate around how much we prioritize our own products versus the national brand ones. Um, National brand ones do drive more customers, uh, but what's but when you do the when you do actually analyze the data and you figure it out, you find that people who buy Grofer's brand products in their first cart are positively correlated with retention. Those who don't buy Grofer's brand products have zero are negatively correlated with retention. So any customer who comes in for that Kisan ketchup deal um, and doesn't pick up any Grofer's brand products is better than even chance of turning on us. Um, and this was a really big revelation because. Uh, it was very, it was a very hard pill to swallow because obviously we want to get revenue. We want to sell, we want to do promotions that work for customers, but they aren't the right kind of customers for us. And this analysis allowed us to see that. Uh, we also use this analysis to look at, uh, for instance, like product development. So these products, flour, tea, salt, have positive correlations with retention. Uh, whereas these are Grofer's brand products, by the way, ones we develop. On the other hand, these products had a lower correlation with retention. A part of that could be a selection bias. Uh, in the case of the toilet cleaner, I think it's actually the quality of the product. <laughs> uh, but, you know, looking at those scores, uh, we can sort of back count and figure out, all right, is this, is this something that we should be investing in product development? Um, a couple other really interesting ones we did, uh, savings. So this was quite fascinating. If we look at it, this, this chart's a little hard to read, but... This is, Grover's whole thing is about savings. We're cheaper than the, the competition. 
Um, this actually looks at the price uh, comparison difference to Big Basket. So if the price is the same as Big Basket, we have a 0.71 correlation to retention. If it's zero to 2%, we have a 1.09 correlation, slightly positive. If it's two to four, it's very positive. But then it totally flattens out. It doesn't really matter. So cheap is only relevant up to a point and past a point, it actually doesn't help with our retention at all. Um, and this was, this insight, you know, would save us a lot of money eventually um, because we were discounting things, assuming that the more we discount, the better our, our customer retention is going to be, but it's just not true. Um, now, what's interesting about this is, this is for orders which are 500 to 1,000 rupees. If we look at orders which are sub 500 rupees, very small orders, we see it's actually a negative correlation. So once we get past 4% savings, it actually dips. And when we get to 10% savings or more, it's a 1.15, it goes way down. And the, uh, the reason for this, if, I don't know if anyone wants to guess, you're welcome to hit the chat room because I can, I can see you. Um, all right, UFIN's IT solutions, welcome to you too. Um, so the, the reason this occurs is that when you run a huge promotion, which is just for, uh, which, is just for which is just about one product, the super savers, the people who are really, really looking for deals all the time, they'll come in, they will buy that one product, uh, and then they will leave again. And so we found a selection bias where we would run these campaigns for some fantastic deal, and we get all this traffic and everyone pat each other on the back and say, job well done. Um, but when you look at the data, those customers never stay with the platform. And so that's what sort of occurs in these small orders with massive savings. Um, other things we learned which, you know, which weren't that important. So uh, Big Basket came out with one day delivery, guaranteed, and everyone went bananas. They spent all this money advertising it. Turns out one day or two day, it's got exactly the same retention uh, coefficient. It doesn't matter. When you get to three days, it starts to drop. So customers actually don't really care by and large. There's a set of customers who do, um, but by and large, our customers didn't seem to care. It had no correlation to retention whatsoever. Um, so these are a few of the examples of things we found out. Um, they allowed us to reprioritize differently. They allowed us to think about our customers differently. They allowed us as an organization to stop having uh, some internal debates and start focusing on the problems we wanted to solve. Um, I, think it's, I think it's pretty cool work. It took a very long time. It was a six month project uh, with you know, Satyam who was heading data engineering, as well as uh, a couple of data scientists, a couple of product managers, some user researchers, uh, spending all this time, you know, going through all this. And one of the main reasons that this took so long um, that to get to this place was that we had really, really poor data governance. Um, and we had really bad data. So it was hard to read. The events we were recording didn't really make sense. There was a lot of errors in the translation between sources to uh, analytics tables. Um, we really didn't have the right data to start with. And so the cleanup effort kind of prevented all this from happening. And I want to just take a moment to not really focus just on, that's obvious. I think everyone knows that you have to have good data to analyze it. Um, but I think the consequence for an agile coach or someone who's looking to work with modern scaled organizations is that it's, at scale, opinions aren't enough. And uh, what ends up happening is unless, unless the data is clean and unless it's accessible by multiple people, uh, then you will end up centralizing decision-making, whether you want to or not. You can decentralize the org all you want. You can create cross-functional teams which have autonomy, but if you, and you can let them decide their own goals. But if you want them to set intelligent goals, which actually makes sense, and you want them to measure them intelligently, <laughs> then they're going to need to use data to do that. Uh, and I learned that uh, despite organizational changes, structural changes, changes the way we work, we weren't really able to give autonomy to the team unless we're able to give them uh, the kind of analysis and the, uh, the exposure to data so they can do their own analysis um, where they can make those decisions and, and find things out. Uh, and I, I have, I think we're at like 1130. Um, Satyam is here. I don't want to like, I want to leave time if there's questions, please start rolling them in. Uh, Satyam did a lot of the technical work in terms of how technical and organizational work to clean up a lot of our data stores. Uh, I don't know if it's, Interesting, you guys, maybe you could write in the chat. We can go through these slides if you want. This is a lot of the actual nitty gritty of how we clean things up. Um, if you'd like to see that, please let me know in the chat. If you'd like to just ask questions um, and we can, and some of them can just answer them or I can answer them. I'm also happy to do that. You make it more interactive, so. 
Any any takers? Okay. Um, so I think we'll go straight to to questions, I guess. Unless someone. So how is different? Uh, is Satyam, Are you are you on the the? Are you on the the call also? Can I hear you? Yeah, yeah I'm there. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, there's a couple of questions here. Let's start with the first one, which I'll do, and you can take the next one. Um, so introduce Orange Cash around 2018. How is it helping? Is another, another significant factor for retention? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> um, Orange Cash was a promotion, which was essentially a, it's a basically a subscription service hidden in a cash back. Um, you spend 2000 bucks during a sale, you get 2000 bucks to spend for free, but you can only spend it so much per month and it has a decay on it. So you kind of have to keep spending with brokers. Uh, it definitely influenced retention. Um, I can't speak to the economics of it because I think that's confidential, uh, but it definitely increased customer retention among those who had orange cash during the time. Yeah. Uh, Ritesh is asking, how is data governance different from master data management? Satyam, do you want to take that? So um, I would say that th these are very similar things in the sense that at the end of the day, uh, master data management is more about creating centralized uh, data repositories, which can be easily accessed. And and you can say that you know some of the portions that we did work upon is around master data management, whereas data governance also talks about not just from how uh, how you are managing data, but how you give accesses to the different people. So uh, in a way, yes, uh, what we did was also you know getting better at uh, uh, you know getting better at master data management so that people can access the right data at the right place. I am not sure if I if I answered your question or not, uh, Jacob. Do you think? Yeah, no. I think that's. I think what I would say the difference is is that master data management, um, in terms of like schema control and and in definition, is extremely important, right? And that's a, a, a fluid, ongoing process. It's not you don't design your schema once. So here it is, and here's your data mart. Now that's the, that's the, we've modeled the organization is going to stay that way. Um, I think data governance is sort of all the things you do to make sure that you are agile enough to adapt to the new and al new analytical needs that you have, um, you know, and operational needs as the business changes and grows, but that it doesn't have to flow through one central entity, that you give people tools to do that in a decentralized way. Yeah. Um, besides to clean the data, what are the steps that you advise to create data governance in a regulated organization? Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what are the steps? Wanted... Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, again, uh, the idea is that uh, you don't want to stop the access to the data, right? But you also want to ensure that it doesn't get misused. So uh, in, a, in an agile organization, it's more about being flexible in a sense that you understand that this team uh, requires this kind of data to get their project executed, to get their goal uh, to achieve their goal, right? So that kind of understanding and uh, the flexibility in the data team helps different teams achieve their goal, right? Uh, while data governance would help you identify what is a PII data, non-PII data, it will help you set up all those processes around data, but that flexibility uh, definitely helps you in achieving those goals for the different teams. So uh, that is what that com comes to my mind. I think yeah. One example, so we sort of talked about like, control automation and speed, but one of the ways of doing distributed control that Satyam and his team worked up um, was they used a, a schema repository um, and basically it would it's a Git repository where people would, they could send pull requests up, et cetera, for different kind of schema changes that they wanted to make. So a team could sort of have a process by which they're making changes and working locally with those changes, but not but but not really changing the master the master data sort of interface for everybody else. Um, so basically, having a difference between gold standard and and sort of prototype um, events and, and event management, I think is really important. So you need to give people a playground to work in, and it can't pollute the main data source and has to sort of uh, abide by PII, you know, uh, sort of <clears throat> security regulations, etc. Um, but giving that staging area where people can can sort of have a middle ground, and that's a complicated technical problem to solve. 
we use Segment uh, for a lot of it. So they're a pretty awesome vendor. They got acquired a couple days ago. So some of our friends are super rich right now <laughs> to find out how they're doing, what islands they're buying. Um, but uh, but yeah, we can, yeah, and if you have specific I, questions around it. Yeah, for, Jacob, yeah. like Jacob said, right? So the idea was that um, at times in an organization, a data team becomes a bottleneck and everyone is kind of dependent on them for anything to happen. With this, uh, like this kind of setup that uh, uh, Jacob is showing, like this is the repository of the schema registry. The idea is that anyone in the team, they want to make a certain change, they make a PR, get it approved, one from their team, one from our team. Now it's a shared responsibility. You get it merged and uh, all of the data ops around it, right? Whether the schema, it's, uh, we have a lot of automation around it to ensure that first of all, people are following basic practices. Uh, they are following the right naming conventions. They're doing all of that and they don't become a blocker on us, right? So it's a very open repository where anyone can contribute. It gets approved and a lot of automation, once it gets merged, happens automatically. So uh, that whole process gets smoothened out. Uh, you take care of PII, you take care of all of that just from this one single source of thing. And in this way, I feel that an organization uh, and different teams can work together on data, which I've usually seen doesn't happen in a lot of organizations. And there's always a centralized data team and you have to wait for them for two months and uh, you're not able to get your reports, all of that. With this, it's very easy. You want an event to be added, create a PR, get it approved, and it will start flowing into all of your systems, be it your warehouse, be it your segment, and it gets validated. All of that starts happening automatically. So that's one of the thing how you basically, you know, uh, not just help in cleaning the data, but at also creating that governance for an organization. Yeah. yeah, and you can see here, like it actually, we sort of in our schema management, it's a team that it's tagged with. So that, like, there's ways to trace back who created this and why they created it. When we first started cleaning up, that was one of the biggest problems. Just like, uh, we have so many hundreds and hundreds of events, who owns these, who's managing them, et cetera. So I think it's not about like gating so much. It's, it's about allowing people to do whatever they want, but making sure we can trace back who did it, when they did it. <laughs> and like, is it, and automating any kind of QA around it. Um, also known as internal democratization of data. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. That was um, an okay name for quite a while. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I think one of the challenges, though, with with all of this, I, I will say, where I think we kind of, I don't know, fell short, but are still are still working at least when I was there. Um, it's that old adage: you can take a horse to water, you can't make him drink. Um, so you can you can give people all the data they want, the cleanest thing. Some people don't actually want to look at data. <laughs> Some people don't actually want to do analysis, unfortunately. So they 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 say they do, um, but really, what they want is an analyst to just solve solve answer a problem for them. Uh, and I think that's a cultural change, which which is actually a lot harder than the technical stuff, to be honest, uh, figuring out which questions to ask. That's why the, the analysis I showed you, I think was was important. I think those frameworks for the kind of questions you want to answer uh, are really important because it, it really defines how you want to think about your data. Um, and just just trying to like organize your data without knowing what kind of questions you're going to answer uh, is a fool's errand and won't, won't accomplish anything. Uh, I'm curious for anyone else out there, um, you know, when you're in your journey with your organizations, particularly as people who are coaches or senior leaders, um, you, you go to a lot of strategy meetings and there's a lot of data torturing. People have an opinion and then they grab a bunch of data to support that opinion and sort of beat everyone up with that data. Um, how have you how have you discovered like in your most the most healthy organizations that you've worked with? How do you how do you find that people are able to sort of go data first as opposed to go opinion first. Has anyone been able to crack that nut and found techniques to work on that? I know it's a tough question, so I'm not expecting to get any good answers, but <laughs> um, anyway, something, something, something to think about. I think that's the next challenge to, to sort of, for me that I'm, I'm sort of pondering. Um, well, cool. Do we have any more questions or should we close up? Just wanted to jump in on the previous question, Jacob. Uh, I think that's a very powerful question. Uh, certainly something that uh, many organizations fool themselves saying they are data first, uh, not opinion first. But I, I think uh, we're all biased uh, and we seem to, uh, you know, again, the whole confirmation bias, we seem to pick data that suits our mental model or our hypothesis. Uh, so I don't know if uh, anyone's really cracked that problem, at least not that I'm aware of. If you do, uh, next year we'll get a talk. 
I, I think one of the, I think one of the, this is the thing to think about actually is how do we, how do we go from answer first to question first? So instead of arguing about what's the right answer, sort of get everyone to agree on what's the right question. Then it's like, it's not about who's got the answer to the question. It's about how should we design this experiment, right? That should be the first step really. Like yep. sort of changing strategy meetings into here's the plan to here's the question <laughs> that's the outcome, right? Um, maybe that would kind of help. Yeah. I think you missed the morning keynote uh, from Rajneesh, uh, but uh, you know, having worked a little bit with him and his startups in the past and his current startup, uh, what I see him as a leader uh, extremely good at is, uh, you know, the whole five why and keep asking the the why till till he really gets to what is the question. You know, everyone's coming up with the solution, but what's the question? And yeah. uh, that brings immense simplicity to to the problem that we're trying to solve because often we complicate things because we have a vested solution within the problem statement. Yeah, uh, and so. You know, some of the things he was sharing today in his presentation were really interesting around uh, why they went back to first principles to question things uh, in a very different way and how getting people to solve multiple problem, problems simultaneously allowed mm -hmm. some of this uh, people not getting too... Uh, the one problem is people get too uh, attached to the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you uh, and his his perspective was if you get people to work on multiple problems simultaneously, they don't get so attached to the solution. Uh, mm -hmm. They focus more on the problem. I thought that was an interesting way to tackle the you know the, what's the what's the question, not, not this answer or solution first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, I think we're we're out of time here, and um, I appreciate you guys hanging out. I'm sorry that. Uh, I kind of rushed into this one. <laughs> I wish I was a little more prepared this time, but I hope you still took something away. Uh, and if there's other things that you would you know, like to ask me or talk to me about, um, whatever, I'm very available and, and love having chats about, about uh, anything that has to do with people enjoying their work life more and getting more done. Um, you can find me on Twitter. It's Jacob Singh. It's my name. It's pretty easy to remember, I think. Uh, and I hope to see you all sometime whenever we can see people again. <laughs>